We will now move ahead to our next panel titled G20 Emerging Key Themes, where the panel will discuss how the G20 has adjusted its priorities and balanced the short-term challenges created by the COVID-19 crisis with its pre-existing long-term goals. I will now welcome again the chair of this panel, Dr. Fahad al-Turki, the chair of T20 Saudi Arabia. Thank you, uh, Saleh. Uh, and um, it's a pleasure to, to moderate uh, this panel with the chairs of um, uh, working groups, the T20 working groups. Um, the, um, the original mandate or the actual mandate of the T20 is to throughout the presidency of any country is to provide um, research-based policy recommendations that will help uh, the policymakers in their debates, either within the working group or or during their ministerial meetings, um, to uh, to be informed and rely on uh, on the policy recommendations that are provided by by the T20. So it's important that we have an open dialogue with the T20 and its, its working group. And throughout this year, we have a number of meetings with, uh, with the working group, so the dialogue is open. So I would like to extend the thanks to the chairs who attended this webinar and also the chairs of other working groups who participated in our previous webinar. The subject of this uh, panel falls naturally within, within the setup of this uh, uh, conference. We started the discussion with His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Abdelaziz bin Salman, the Minister of Energy, talking about or giving us an idea of how the pandemic uh, affected the economy, the society, the environment, and also the energy, energy sector. And then we went into the, the discussion by uh, uh, Dr. Tedros on terms of what is the status quo and how we are dealing with it from a health side perspective. And the previous panel um, uh, took a deep dive into, in, into this issue uh, with Dr. Yassin, uh, our lead co-chair for um, our Task Force 11, which is dedicated on COVID-19. And now we would like to hear from the, um, the chairs of the working groups uh, on how the pandemic has affected the, the, the agenda for the G20. As we know, the G20 um, uh, had some experience with previous crises, but probably not to this magnitude of crisis. This crisis started as uh, a health crisis and then but evolved into a universal crisis with worldwide multi-dimensional consequences on our societies and economic systems. So it is an opportunity to, um, uh, to see how we are reshaping the agenda of the G20 in light of this. Uh, and also get an overview of emerging challenges that do, are not necessarily related to the current crisis. Um, uh, as, we, as, as we've seen and highlighted in the extraordinary uh, summit, the Saudi priorities um, remain empowering people, saving the planet, and uh, new frontiers. I'm happy to have with me today uh, five, um, five chairs of the working groups, including Her Highness Princess Haifa uh, al migran the chair of the development working group, and His Excellency Abdurrahman Al Harbi, the chair of trade and investment working group, and Dr. Khaled Al Abdul Qadir, the chair of the environment working group, and Dr. Abdurrahman Al Amri, the chair of the education working group, and Abdul Mahsan Al Khalaf, the chair of the finance working group. We will start by uh, giving the floor to, uh, uh, to each of the panelists to give us a, a high level overview of um, what, how, the how the change in the agenda is and how they see the implications of COVID-19 on the, on the working group and what is expected from uh, the T20 uh, down the road and or during the working group meetings that we participate in. 
But before I give the floor to uh, to the participant to, to to the uh, to the panelists, I would like to request from our uh, attendees. If you have any questions as we go over uh, the presentations and the overview, please post your question in the Q&A chat box. And if I may ask you to uh, uh, be as brief as possible and add to, add to the question who you're asking, which, um, which panelists, and that will help us save time and uh, get the question to the, to the right person. Without further ado, I would like to start with uh, Her um, Highness Princess Haifa Migran, the chair of the development group. The floor is yours, Haifa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the T20 for inviting us today. Um, I'm very humbled and I feel privileged today to be a part of this uh, esteemed panel and uh, very esteemed panelists. Um, I would not uh, like to take so much uh, time. I will try to be brief, but please stop me if I get too excited. Um, as you know, in the development working group, uh, we are in charge of promoting development in uh, less, uh, least income countries. And uh, that uh, helps us uh, to focus more on sustainable development agenda. Uh, during this year's uh, presidency and the G20 Saudi Arabia presidency, uh, the development working group focused on three priorities. Uh, first, the first one is modernizing the accountability framework. Second one is developing guidelines for quality infrastructure for regional connectivity. And the third one is the multi-year framework for financing for development or for sustainable development. Um, if we dig deeper to down the uh, first uh, priority, uh, the modernizing the uh, accountability framework was established in 2013. Um, and that was before uh, the uh, declaration of the uh, sustainable development agenda. And this uh, called for us as a development working group to uh, create a new accountability framework that is more simple, more uh, shorter, and better focused on ensuring the goals and priorities are met. <clears throat> we wanted to reach more audience, um, have more credibility as a development working group. And that's why we started early uh, to include all uh, countries or member countries in the discussion uh, and uh, have something that is uh, collectively owned by the G20 members so we can report on our development commitments more accurately. Um, in addition, uh, we are also drafting the Riyadh update on G20 action plan on the 2030 agenda and the annual update on the G20 development commitment. The second priority, uh, given the mandate of the development working group to promote development, uh, the development working group in 2020 brought the discussion on quality infrastructure for region, regional connectivity. It is building on uh, previous legacies, in addition to the importance of infrastructure as uh, since it has a multiplier effect on other sustainable development dimensions. Um, currently, we are in the process of uh, finalizing guidelines uh, that are uh, uh, built on uh, quality infrastructure, as I said, and that they cover, uh, first of all, risk and return, second, managing supply and influencing demand, and third, regional and international cooperation and innovation. Um, these area, areas aim to address challenges such as financing, uh, prerequisites for infrastructure investment, and private sector investment. In our work, uh, we highlighted the important or still highlight the importance of resilience in connectivity infrastructure and its role in supporting countries in times of shocks such as pandemic today. The third priority, which is uh, in the area of financing for sustainable development, we are proposing a multi-year framework that aims to support the global efforts in financing for sustainable development and its goals. Uh, in, in 2015, since the launch of uh, the Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, the work on uh, implementation has focused on estimating the costs of the implementation of the agenda, estimating the financing gap, and then identifying instruments uh, to attract financing, finances to close these gaps, and then thirdly, develop uh, the tools, measures, and guidelines that can guide and monitor the allocation of private and public expenditure and investment towards the agenda. Yet, in 2019, 
the uh, UN Secretary General noted that we are seriously off track with the progress on SDGs since 2015. He continued that the lack of financing is one of the obstacles. Therefore, this year, uh, the priority brings focus to sustainable financing for sustainable development uh, through encouraging utilization of viable sources of financing that promotes indigenous growth. Specifically, we propose a development of strategy anchored to supporting national efficient savings and investment that promote inclusive growth. In addition, of course, we have a side event tomorrow uh, that's going to discuss the role of private savings schemes and building managerial capital in supporting sustainable development. We will also learn from representatives from other countries uh, who will discuss the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in their countries, societies, and economies and share their experiences. I know that I'm exceeding my time. Just one, just one final thing. Uh, this month, uh, we have introduced the uh, G20 Action Plan for Emergency Response to COVID-19 in Africa and least developed countries. This is going to be discussed uh, the day after tomorrow in our second development working group meeting. Um, these, this action plan, uh, our voluntary action plan, uh, aims to help Africa and least developed countries to meet their essential needs of, uh, of the most vulnerable um, and control the pandemic. In addition, control the impacts of the pandemic, uh, and ultimately set the path forward for a sustainable recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Princess Pepa. Um, we, we now move to uh, His Excellency uh, Abdurrahman al Harbi and the Chair of the Trade and Investment Working Group. Thank you, Dr. Fahad. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, uh, or good evening. Good and um, uh, thank you as well to uh, 220 and its members for inviting me to this um, uh, important conversation. And allow me first to start by thanking all the frontliners who are paying their uh, and um, uh, risking their lives to protect us. And uh, big thanks and high appreciation for them. Um, and let me start with the fact that the the uh, the COVID-19 uh, has certainly required the G20 to adjust its agenda. And um, I'm very happy and glad to see that uh, that we have uh, uh, seen that the G20 members have been um, showing great flexibility and unity of purpose in working together to respond to this uh, uh, um, health and economic impacts of the pandemic, including the aspect of the trade and investment. Um, indeed, international trade and investment uh, flows constitute one of the main uh, channels of transmission of the pandemic over the um, uh, global economic activity. Uh, trade has been hit simultaneously by supply, demand, and uh, trade cost shocks. And also we are facing the um, uh, a dramatic slowdown of the FDI's flows. The crisis reminded us of the importance um, uh, and the important role of the G20 uh, can play in enhancing international cooperation uh, to face global uh, challenges, as it did, honestly, um, uh, in the previous crisis since 2008. And I hope that we come out, out, of, out of this crisis with a the, with the, with the renewed sense of purpose um, and shared conviction about the work that the G20 members can do together. Uh, during the first two weeks, uh, uh, back in March, uh, it became clear that we, uh, we would need to adapt. Uh, while we are head holding our discussions, uh, most countries started to adopt some of the measures, uh, such as uh, restrictions to uh, international travel or regulate trade and investment in response to the pandemic. More than ever, uh, governments have to coordinate um, their actions if they want to effectively cope with this unprecedented situation. Uh, first, uh, they have to cooperate to address and tackle the um, short-term issues such as the disruption in the global um, supplies uh, logistic chains. And second, they realize that they will have to work together uh, on longer term and more uh, profound strategy to mitigate as much as possible the, um, the economic effects of the lockdowns um, across the world are having in the global economy. Uh, following to the call, uh, uh, following to that, uh, let me call our leaders um, uh, uh, where they presented on, on March uh, 
a, and I quote, a united uh, front against the common threat. The Saudi presidency uh, convened, uh, convened um, uh, immediately a ministerial uh, trade and investment ministerial meeting uh, a few days later and have asked us as a TWIG, which I chair as a TWIG group, uh, to uh, discuss additional recommended actions to um, uh, help alleviate the wide impact of the pandemic, as well as longer term actions uh, that, should, that should be taken to support the multilateral trading system and expedite the economic recovery. The TWIG uh, group have put together a document called the G20 Action to Support uh, World Trade and Investment in Response to COVID-19 which endorsed by the ministers in their second virtual meeting later on. Uh, the actions were grouped into two categories, short-term responses and long-term actions. Uh, the short-term responses, which are designed to alleviate the impact uh, of the COVID-19, include actions related to trade regulations, trade um, facilitation, transparency, operation of lo and logistics uh, networks, and the provision uh, to support uh, the emissions. On the long-term actions, um, uh, which are related to supporting the necessary reforms of the WTO and strengthening the international uh, investment and bring and building resiliency into the global supply chains as well. Uh, these G20 actions are critical uh, element of the coordinated G20 response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will continue to monitor the implementation of this uh, uh, in the lead up to the um, uh, leaders summit that will take place later on this year. Uh, but as much as we have had a chance to, uh, a cha to change and adopt, the crisis has also reconfirmed on the trade and investment side that we, are, we were headed down the right path and has re-established our focus on our original priorities that we had agreed upon with the G20 members uh, at the beginning of our presidencies. Indeed, the crisis has confirmed the importance of, hoping, of, he of helping all countries to have a more diverse economic structure which will bring more resilience to external shocks. Uh, it has shown also uh, with the increased urgency the need to sustain MSMEs and to uh, prepare them better to compete internationally. Uh, it will require also an additional effort to ensure that the investment uh, um, can flow between countries and to meet the sustainable development goals. Uh, and it has also and finally reminded us of the importance of the free fair, non-discriminatory, uh, transparent, predictable, and stable trade and investment uh, environment, and the important role that the WTO plays re engaging us in our commitment to improve its functioning. To sum up, the COVID-19 pandemic has both forced us to adopt and confirmed our original purpose. We will continue to work with our colleagues on the G20 to overcome this crisis and to work uh, on structural trade and investment policies that realize its role as engines for growth, productivity, job creation, innovation, and development. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman. Um, now we, we move to Dr. Khaled Al Abdul Qadir, the co chair of the Environment Working Group. Thank you, Dr. Fahad. Uh, thank you for the T20 for the invitation. And uh, I'm very glad really to be uh, participants uh, with the honored guest today. And um, uh, really, as, uh, for, from an environmental perspective, uh, what's happening uh, in the uh, uh, COVID uh, crisis, uh, it is a testimony for uh, for the importance of the environmental balance and the ecosystem sustainability uh, for uh, uh, and to, to have an environmental protection. And uh, even though uh, to what we have seen in a lot of recoveries um, that happened in a short period and short term, as uh, uh, His Royal Highness uh, uh, Prince Abdelaziz mentioned that uh, shouldn't really uh, unfocus our attention to the uh, long-term environmental uh, uh, issues. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> so, as in Saudi Arabia, we, we um, uh, the G20 uh, environmental uh, priorities. We selected the three uh, uh, priorities, which is one of them is uh, combating land degradation, habitat loss. 
and uh, second, improving coral reef resilience and reducing marine plastic to marine environment. Next. So, uh, in, in, uh, uh, as an important uh, issue in vegetation cover and soil and how that is providing fatal ecosystem, uh, we, we, we see that as important in economy, uh, as important for a big percentage of population, and also as a health uh, issues in pharmaceutical uh, um, uh, medicines and also as a water source, climate regulation and, and the vegetation cover of, of, the, of, the, of the land, and also as uh, uh, biodiversity uh, uh, growth and biodiversity uh, also sustainability, where 80% of the, all the biodiversity really rely in, 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 uh, in the vegetation cover of, of rangeland and uh, forest and also as uh, in soil, as sustainable land. Next, please. <clears throat> yeah, but in fact, land degradation habitat loss is occurring in very alarming rate, as uh, more than 12 million hectares lost every year, and also 93% of land degradation is, uh, is attributed to, to deforestation and uh, overgrazing and other uh, human uh, factors. And that's cost uh, the world between six to 11 trillions as uh, ecosystem surfaces and 50% of biodiversity loss. And all of these uh, 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 factors uh, together, it's, it's uh, attributed to, to so many human activities from grazing to development to, uh, to uh, species intervention and, and also regime change. Next. Uh, therefore, we, we, we are uh, calling for uh, restoring uh, uh, by 2040 uh, 1 billion hectare, and that's uh, um, around 50% uh, of the degraded land currently. And how that will be uh, if we reach it uh, by the collaboration effort between all the G20 countries that could achieve uh, so many uh, uh, SDG goals and uh, uh, mainly is that uh, uh, achieving the land, uh, life on land, and also climate action, and also reduce uh, poverty, and also other, other SDG goals uh, uh, to the world. Uh, next, please. Uh, the second priority, uh, it is improving coral reef resilience, which is also uh, very important as uh, for the health of the oceans. Uh, because coral reef, as you know, is an important habitat for marine biodiversity and also it's very highly productive ecosystem uh, for fish and invertebrates and, the coast, and also to protect coastal areas and supporting of tourism and recreation. All of these is uh, generating more than $370 billion uh, uh, per year. And, uh, but in fact, all of these reefs are now in the oceans uh, there are so many reports that indicating these reefs could be lost by 2030 or 90% of that could be lost because of a lot of uh, human activities that uh, need to be reduced, such as overfishing, pollution, damaging fishing method, ocean acidification, ocean warming, and uh, so others. Um, and the third uh, priority that we are also uh, 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 as an environmental target, it is, uh, it is reducing marine plastic to, to, uh, uh, to the marine environment. And this is uh, maintaining the momentum created by the Osaka Blue Oceans, in fact, last year in Japan, and to continue the, to share the best practices among those. And most of all of these uh, three uh, priorities it could be achieved uh, mainly by reducing uh, our impacts, so by changing our uh, uh, regulation and standards, and that will affect a lot in, in, in improving all the biodiversity of land and biodiversity in marine, and also reducing a lot of uh, pollution to the marine environment. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Um, and um, next, we uh, have, uh, or please turn to Farad Rahman Al Amri, uh, the chair of uh, the Education Working Group. Rahman? 
can you un unmute? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, Your Highness, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And uh, it's great to be with you uh, today. Uh, I would like also uh, to thank T20 for organizing this important event. Um, like uh, almost all facets of, of uh, our life, uh, COVID-19 has impacted education. Um, uh, education, uh, this, the outbreak of this pandemic has impacted uh, education worldwide and led to mass and prolonged closure of schools and uh, uh, educational institutions with over 90% of learners uh, affected at uh, its peak. Therefore, the discussion of education working group have been extended uh, and adjusted in order to include uh, and address COVID-19 and its impact on education. Uh, priorities and outcomes of the education working group, as you can uh, see on the left side of the uh, screen, um, uh, last year before COVID-19, the education uh, working group had uh, defined two priorities to discuss. First, early childhood education as a foundation for developing global competence and 21st century skills. Second, internationalization in education. For early childhood education, the education working group was interested in two subtopics. Research has, uh, the first one was equitable access to quality early childhood education, as research has clearly shown the importance of the stage and children's lives as it provides the foundation and uh, that uh, uh, are key to unlocking children's full potential. Therefore, it's, it's important uh, to increase uh, access to quality early childhood education across G20 countries and the wider international community. The second subtopic concerns the use and impact of technologies in early childhood education. Digital technologies are increasingly present in children's life and can have both positive and negative impacts because of the uncertainty involving, uh, involving uh, especially young children um, in technology and the use of technology with this age group, the education working group discussed the need for more research on the use and impact of digital technologies. Uh, consequently, one of the intended outcomes of the working group is uh, such a study that will investigate the use of digital technologies in young children. The second priority of education working group is internationalization in education. Internationalization uh, currently uh, is largely understood in terms of mobility of students, teachers, and, and researchers. Uh, uh, also uh, in uh, integrating international dimension into curriculum and, and teaching methods uh, and uh, learning outcomes. We wanted to extend the discussion uh, uh, to include a focus on internationalization at home or the internationalization uh, 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 of, uh, uh, you know, uh, digital mobility and the availability of different uh, uh, digital contents for students uh, worldwide. In addition, education working groups thinks that there are opportunities for G20 uh, countries to further collaborative uh, uh, work on virus internationalization education programs, not only in the tertiary level, but also in the K-12 uh, level. For uh, the second uh, priority, we are working towards creating a report on internationalization education, which showcases good practices of G20 countries in internationalization for the benefit of the entire group and the rest of the world. On the right side of the slide uh, of the screen, um, as you know, uh, some adjustment uh, have been made due to the outbreak of COVID-19. Following the spread of COVID-19 and its historic and unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, impact on education, the Education Working Group adjusted its outcomes and priorities. First, the study on the use of digital technologies by young children has been re-envisioned to include an investigation 
of the access to remote learning during COVID-19 pandemic by young children. Second, the report on internationalization in education now includes various sections that highlighted the impact of COVID-19 on internationalization activity, especially mobility, because of the uh, travel restrictions, as you know. Finally, and most importantly, uh, uh, at the suggestion of His Excellency, the Minister of Education, Dr. Hamad uh, bin Muhammad Al Sheikh, uh, Minister of Education of Saudi Arabia, we proposed to host an extraordinary virtual ministers' meeting to further the discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on education and to guide countries' responses to ensure education continuity and resilience especially in the context of global crisis. The meeting was well received by G20 countries and will take place at the end of this month. In addition, the topic of education continuity and resilience in the face of global crisis has also been added to the upcoming discussions of the educa education working group meetings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman, uh, for um, enlightening presentation. Uh, last but not least, uh, move to uh, Abdel Mahsan Al Khalaf, the uh, chief, policy, chief policy officer of the P20 Finance Track Program. Abdel Mahsan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and uh, my sincere thanks and appreciation uh, to the T20 and to you, Dr. Fahad, for organizing this timely and important discussion. Thanks also for inviting me to participate in this panel. It is uh, truly a pleasure to be with you all uh, today. Uh, indeed, as mentioned uh, before, this is unprecedented crisis with uh, interlinked health, social, and economic implications. Uh, it started as a health crisis, but the evolution and the global spread of the COVID-19 pandemic has also delivered a deep shock to the global economy against the backdrop of disruptions in both supply and demand. A crisis of this unprecedented magnitude underscores the need for a collective and coordinated global response. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in its capacity as the G20 presidency for 2020, immediately took concrete actions to derive and coordinate an international response to the pandemic. On March uh, 26, the Saudi G20 presidency convened an extraordinary virtual G20 summit, which triggered a coordinated global response, endorsing a set of collective actions to tackle the crisis and pave the return to strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth. Let me uh, briefly outline some of key actions that the G20 has taken uh, as they relate to the uh, G20 finance track. Uh, first, as this is uh, first and foremost uh, a health emergency crisis, uh, G20 members and invited countries mobilized funding totaling over $21 billion to close the financing gap in global health. Uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia pledged 500 million as seed contribution in support of such international efforts. Uh, second, uh, the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors endorsed the G20 action plan to support the global economy during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. This action plan is a living document that sets out the key principles guiding the G20 response and its commitment uh, to specific actions to drive forward international cooperation as we navigate this crisis and look ahead for a robust and sustained global economic recovery. Uh, third, G20 members have injected an unprecedented $8 trillion into the global economy, the largest stimulus ever, by taking swift, wide-ranging and substantial actions to respond to the challenges stemming from the COVID-19. Fourth, the G20 has worked with international financial institutions to rapidly implement significant financial support to countries in need, ensuring increased support and access to emergency financing, thereby strengthening global economic and financial stability and resilience. Actions in this regard include delivering a comprehensive IMF support package, 
estimated at more than 22 billion to 60 developing countries and also implementing urgent support by the World Bank and multilateral development banks amounting to more than 200 billion. Finally, the G20 has agreed to a historic initiative that calls for debt suspension, providing over 14 billion in relief to the poorest countries, which will enable them to focus their efforts and resources on fighting the pandemic. Uh, the G20 has faced unprecedented challenges during the pandemic, nevertheless, through the support of uh, members, invited countries, international organizations, the G20 have taken significant and novel actions to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. With this crisis, we have two different time horizons to combat the economic consequences of COVID-19. First, the immediate global response to avoid deep and prolonged negative economic effects. Second, the medium and long-term imperative to foster a rapid recovery of the global economy. The G20 will continue to act decisively in two fronts, tackling the crisis and laying the foundations for a better future. Working together, we can defeat this common enemy, recover stronger and with more resilience. Thank you, Dr. Fahad. Thank you, Abdel Mahsen, and uh, thanks to all our uh, esteemed panelists for their um, insightful um, introductory remarks. Um, if we take stock of what uh, the discussion been so far, uh, and we look at the the common word that we we hear from number of uh, speakers um, since two uh, in this afternoon, I think there are a number of words that is highlight are highlighted uh, uh, more often. More often, the one thing is which is no brainery is this is unprecedented uh, uh, crisis of a global nature. Uh, and the second uh, common word that we hear uh, is the need for uh, multilateralism or the need for uh, solidarity, uh, cooperation, uh, and, um, and the like. I would like to pose a question to, to any of, uh, of, the, of the panelists to, to, uh, to answer is what is the impact of this crisis on the multilateralism? Have we, has this crisis created um, a new obstacles to multilateralism as an efficient approach to solving global problems? And we've seen that uh, the closure of global borders and so on, and these are issues or the disruption to the, to the supply chain. While these are issues uh, or measures are taken for um, health consideration, they also impact the effectiveness of our multilateral, multilateral system. Or is it on the contrary? Has it, has, it, has it reinforced the international desire for multilateralism? What is the view of the chairs of the, of the working group um, on, on the impact of this pandemic on the multilateralism? Any view? You'd like me to start with the third on this, and then I can. Uh, um, can I start, please? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, let me just give uh, just quick response to this, and then uh, uh, the rest of the colleagues may may, may uh, provide their comments as well. It's just you know. Uh, as a chair of the Trade and Investment Working Group, I don't think that the multilateral, uh, the, 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 the crisis have already uh, uh, created obstacles to the multilateral trading system. Um, it's a fact that the multilateral trading rule that we have today at the WTO uh, allow uh, flexible application, especially in crises such as the health crisis. And um, the key here is that the coordination among members and uh, uh, to make sure that countries are using this as inbuilt flexible, uh, flexibility in a fair way. Uh, G20 leaders and ministers have shown leadership in this by stating that the um, uh, emergency measures aimed at protecting health will be targeted, proportionate, transparent, and temporary. 
these are key messages that we it, it shows the the uh, the understanding and the, the flexibility that we have on the current trading rules. Uh, so uh, multilateral solutions are required for multinational problems, and this is the statement that, that if I'm not mistaken, His Royal Highness at the beginning mentioned that statement, and which is true. And you, you might see other systems or other um, approaches that are applied, which is uh, 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 tailored to a certain situation. But definitely, uh, when we speak about uh, an international and a multilateral problem now, we are definitely in need of having a, multila a multi multilateral cooperation. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, uh, so the emergence of a global pandemic necessarily uh, uh, focuses attention to the multilateral cooperation. And in this regard, uh, let me just uh, um, uh, point that, that maybe you have seen that the statement by the G20 trade ministers that uh, we have issued um, and been adopted by them in, in, in May 14th. It was a collective uh, commitment uh, and a collective response. And, uh, it, um, and the name of that response was the G20 actions uh, uh, to support the world trade and investment in response to the uh, COVID-19. And this provides um, uh, a great and important support to the multilateralism. So I just wanted to highlight this in general, uh, that's from uh, my point of view, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your, uh, Your Excellency. Um, if I may now um, turn the, the mic to uh, uh, Princess Haifa, if I may ask you a follow-up question. Um, many of the, um, of the initiatives under, uh, under the development uh, working group and under also the development discussion uh, are long-term uh, in nature. Um, have, have you seen, uh, is there an immediate problem created by the COVID-19 crisis diverting the international attention uh, and action from crucial long-term um, development challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, indeed, of course, there is an immediate need. Uh, COVID <coughs> created a sense of emergency and immediate need that needs to be fulfilled and uh, a sharp increase in the financing gap that we have, we have been discussing, we have been discussing in the development working group, which is all, uh, uh, I mean, right, as you have rightly so said. Uh, what we have done in the development working group is that we have introduced, as I said before, the G20 action plan for the emergency response. But at the same time, uh, we have discussed uh, heavily with the other uh, G20 members, the issue of how can we build sustainable uh, outcomes that can promote sustainable development beyond the crisis. So yes, there is the realization understanding of the urgency of COVID-19. Yes, it created a pressure, but uh, in the uh, collective understanding of the G20 countries, there is uh, a common consensus that we need to build a resilient future in order to be able to uh, withstand such pandemic or such uh, crisis that take place. I may uh, want to quote uh, Dr. Michelle uh, Bocos from the WHO when she said preparedness is an investment. And I think this is what we are uh, doing right now, is that we are preparing for a sustainable future. Uh, we are uh, building for a better recovery. Uh, there is a great sense of that, a collective sense of that in the, within the G20 countries. Uh, thank you. If I, uh, if I may, uh, Dr. Khaled Abdel Qadir, uh, probably there's also a question uh, related to, uh, to the environment. I mean, what is the shift that caused by or the shift from long-term goals to short-term goals within the environment that is caused by COVID-19? Are we seeing more focus on short-term environmental issues than long-term? Can you unmute, please? Thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, Doctor. Um, yes, in fact, uh, the short-term uh, could appear in, from environmental perspective 
um, as uh, a lot of uh, good news for, for environmental issues, such as recovery of a lot of uh, uh, um, habitats and recovery for, uh, for a lot of uh, animals and all of that. But these are uh, some um, uh, symptoms of uh, the uh, reduced pressure on the environment now. But uh, we need to keep focus uh, on, on, on those long term pressure. And uh, uh, yes, in the short term also it's reduced some of the collaborative action and collaborative plans that we have with a lot of countries and uh, to, uh, to focus on the long term. Uh, uh, in fact, um, uh, so many uh, events and that, that were uh, affected uh, and a lot of uh, collaborative uh, uh, opportunities were uh, postponed. Uh, however, uh, the long-term uh, commitment to, toward the environment it has uh, become stronger as an evidence of the needs uh, for a lot of collaborative uh, uh, efforts between all the countries, as uh, we have seen uh, the importance of to have a productive uh, ecosystem, importance for, for uh, rehabilitation, of uh, so uh, uh, many hectares of, of lands around the world and the importance of, uh, of a reduction of uh, a lot of pollutants as uh, that will increase uh, the, the food uh, supply and food security for the whole world. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, and, and I think uh, this is uh, definitely uh, a huge challenge for the policy makers um, regardless of where what the theme is that they're focusing on in terms of balancing the long term uh, versus the short term in terms of the uh, uh, also applies to, uh, to, to the economy. Uh, you mentioned that there are um, uh, immediate uh, actions that require to be to be taken uh, during the financial crisis uh, to tackle the, uh, the impact or the short-term impact of COVID-19, uh, as well as keeping in mind the long-term um, uh, goals. Uh, can you um, elaborate uh, what are the thoughts in terms of the immediate um, challenges that the, the finance crop is, is facing? So thank you so much for uh, this question. Very interesting how uh, uh, actually uh, what we are doing in the finance track is we are looking at uh, two uh, time uh, horizon or two actions to be taken. The first uh, action or the uh, first set of actions will focus on the uh, immediate response containing the pandemic, treating the affected and preventing further transmission. Uh, the second will be to, uh, this will happen while ensuring or maintaining the conditions for uh, the recovery and then working on the uh, recovery phase to foster the uh, strong and uh, sustainable uh, recovery. Uh, as you know, when we, uh, Saudi Arabia assumed uh, the G20 presidency in December 2019, uh, when it proposed uh, an agenda uh, based on the theme of realizing opportunities of the 21st centuries for all. Uh, and uh, uh, with that uh, theme, there uh, is a list of priorities that deal with global long uh, challenges, enhancing resilience and promoting sustainability. Uh, this would, uh, what is uh, what I would call our baseline agenda. Uh, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, began, we added some priority to our baseline agenda to address this global challenge, including the immediate response. Uh, but we are uh, also committed uh, to sparing no efforts in uh, the fight uh, uh, against uh, the pandemic, while equally uh, committed to continue to work on our uh, baseline uh, agenda. And... Uh, let me uh, give uh, an example uh, in one of the uh, long-term challenges that we are working on, uh, which is enhancing access to opportunities for all. Uh, 
uh, this priority uh, deals with long-term challenges impeding access to opportunities and focuses on addressing inequality and empowering all segments of society, especially women and youth. Uh, G20 members recently discussed uh, a many of policy options that the presidency prepared for enhancing access uh, to opportunity. We received responses from all G20 countries and the draft currently includes uh, 60 plus case studies from uh, G20 member countries. Uh, this is uh, only uh, an example of uh, many that reflect G20 members' commitment to addressing long-term uh, challenges. And uh, I think uh, we are, uh, uh, this global uh, crisis is reinforcing our conviction that addressing global um, uh, medium and long-term challenges will result in a better and more resilient uh, global economy. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul Mahsin. And uh, allow me to, to, to follow up with, uh, with another question. Um, this is because uh, we, we know the, the, finance, the finance track within the G20 is, is the most experienced track within, within the G20 in terms of tackling crisis. Uh, we have more finance crisis than, uh, than, uh, than other. Um, so in, during the extraordinary uh, uh, G20 summit, there was uh, uh, a, a very ambitious uh, commitment uh, by, uh, by the leaders. Uh, but soon after, uh, there have been a number of reports and studies that uh, saw this commitment uh, falling short of the magnitude of the, of the crisis itself. Uh, do you think that there will be uh, more to come uh, in terms of um, uh, support for um, for the global economy, and how was the uncertainty surrounding the dynamics of the of the pandemic influenced the uh, the G twenty decisions um, at that time and moving forward? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Very uh, important question. Uh, so uh, the G20's urgent and collective priority is to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and its uh, interlinked social health, social and economic uh, impacts. Uh, our leaders uh, committed in their extraordinary summit uh, to ambitious actions to protect lives, uh, jobs and support the global economy while standing ready to take uh, further actions if needed. Uh, indeed, uh, this year has witnessed the implementation of exceptional measures, including unprecedented physical, monetary, financial stability actions, and ensuring that international financial institutions can provide critical support to countries in need. However, this crisis cannot be resolved and, uh, uh, until the health emergency is effectively addressed. This is above all a health emergency crisis that requires a response uh, like none uh, before. So uncertainty is high and we all understand that the, uh, the process of normalization will take time as the lockdown measures are eased gradually and mobility recovers slowly. So we are currently working uh, to address the gaps and vulnerabilities uncovered by the pandemic, enhance preparedness for future pandemics, and identify actions that will support a path to a strong recovery. With respect to the upcoming deliverables for the G20 in 2020, uh, the finance track has agreed to maintain a laser focus on the pandemic response, while also ensuring continuity of the 2020 agenda as they are crucial to ensuring a smooth recovery once the pandemic uh, is behind, up, behind us. We have uh, exciting work ahead of us on enhancing access to opportunities. We also have interesting deliverables uh, under the infrastructure working group, focusing on increasing private investment in infrastructure, which will be extremely important to support the recovery efforts. Uh, in addition, we have uh, uh, work on digital financial inclusion, international taxation agenda with tax transparency and digital taxation, and on financial regulation with an ambitious agenda to frame regulatory and supervisory issues 
for uh, the digital era. Within uh, the financial, uh, international financial architecture, we have relevant work on the capital uh, market development and excessive capital flows uh, volatility, as well as debt sustainability and transparency, all of which will be discussed in the upcoming session of uh, the D20 finance ministers and central bank governors. Thank you, Abdel Mehsan. Um, uh, and I think um, we now turn to um, uh, Dr. Abdrahman Al Amri uh, on, uh, on on education. And I think there has been a major, um, as many other sectors uh, within the society, an impact on on education. The lockdown and social distancing measures due to the pandemic have um, definitely affected. Um, affected schools or, or around the world. Um, my question is, um, have the education system surprised us by their resilience uh, or, or on the opposite, by their lack of, uh, of resilience? And before you answer, Abdrahman, uh, if, if I may, uh, I would like to remind our uh, attendees to post their questions to the Q&A uh, chat. Uh, and make it as short as possible with um, to whom you want to ask the question. Uh, Rahman, you're muted. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fahad. Of course, as, as many of my colleagues uh, have uh, said before, this is unprecedented. Uh, uh, a thing. Uh, uh, the, the impact of COVID-19, uh, like many other sectors, education was highly affected by uh, the outbreak. Uh, as I said, at its peak, 1.6 billion students, which makes 91% per, of the global student uh, uh, population, they were uh, impacted by uh, school closure. 195 countries introduced either local uh, or nationwide closure uh, of schools. There has not been an instance in modern history where the education ecosystems has experienced such a shock. Uh, many uh, issues were associated with the, uh, I mean, shift to alternative solutions, including uh, limited internet connectivity and, and uh, le uh, distance learning capabilities, uh, especially in, in uh, less developed countries. Uh, responses, uh, uh, I mean, by countries, that they needed to uh, have a, a concerted effort uh, global. Both governments and international organizations needed to mobilize unique and innovative solutions to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. And many uh, uh, countries and international organizations, including UNESCO, OECD, and World Bank, UNICEF, among others, they, they have mobilized uh, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of work onto that. Uh, responses by G20 countries to mitigate the impact of G20 of the pandemic has been varied. Uh, a variety of, of changes, uh, activating distance learning solutions, implementing countrywide closures of schools, providing the students, parents, and, edu and educators with social support, the uh, uh, need to cope with distance learning measures, uh, uh, financial uh, support, ensuring availability and ac accessibility. If we are speaking Saudi Arabia, for example, it was one of the first countries to announce school closures among the G20. This was on the 8th of uh, March. On the 9th of March, distance learning was uh, activated and uh, hundreds of thousands of students were able to use it. Uh, 20 uh, TV channels, a lot of digital context, uh, AIM channels on YouTube, with all these uh, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, teaching uh, materials and contents. Uh, committee responsible for distance learning rollout, launch of awareness campaigns, uh, issues of assessment guidelines, provision of technical support to education platforms, uh, partnering with private sector to provide equipment and connectivity uh, to vulnerable and underserved groups to ensure education continuity. Uh, I mean, uh, all these, 
uh, uh, efforts by Saudi Arabia and other uh, G20 countries uh, showed that uh, we have uh, systems that are resilient and they have uh, the infrastructure and the ability to shift into alternative solutions in times of crisis. This was great. Uh, however, we need to work together individually and collaboratively with uh, other countries and with the international organizations in order to uh, share practices and uh, exchange experiences to ensure continuity education uh, in the short for in the short term medium term and long term especially in times of uh, global crisis thank you thank you uh, dr Abdurrahman. um and if i if i may uh, uh before i open the floor for questions from our uh, attendees I want to go back to uh, Your Excellency uh, uh, Rahman Al, Al Harbi on trade. Um, trade has been a challenging issue um, even before the pandemic. Um, there was uh, the tendency of uh, protectionism uh, and the talk about uh, trade war and how that affected the, um, um, the global economic growth. Um, back in 2019 and, uh, and a few years before as well. Um, but in the crisis period, um, a country, uh, so countries tend to impose trade restrictions, such as the controls on food or medical equipment that we've seen uh, recently in, in some countries. How, the, how this has um, influenced the discussion uh, within, within the working group, um, or the trade working group? Thank you, Dr. Uh, I believe, uh, let me start before I go and how we address this within the working group. Let me start with that the fact that uh, we all, all governments around the world, uh, protect the interests of their uh, citizens. And this is a fact. It's right for every country. And um, uh, if a country doesn't have uh, a, uh, a sufficient supply of a certain essential commodity, such as uh, medicines or PPEs or food and uh, it is expected to, to, to keep what they have uh, within their country as a stock to uh, fulfill the need of their citizens. So imagine a country uh, doesn't have, doesn't produce a certain product or a commodity they will definitely and it's expected uh, uh, they will hold to what they have uh, to fulfill the need of their uh, 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 immediate need for their citizens. So. Uh, just an example, no one expected Italy to export uh, uh, the, the uh, life-saving supplies at the height uh, of its crisis. And no WTO rule or any other international rule would see that or require that as an action against the interest uh, of, of, of an, of, uh, against the uh, national interest of any country. So that's, that's a fact. So uh, there is a flexibility and there is an expectation of the behaviors. But now let me tell you how did we, um, uh, uh, how do we see that? Uh, definitely uh, at a longer term, and this is a temporary or, or a short term maybe response by some of the uh, governments, but on the long term, uh, restrictions on export. And as you mentioned, some, some of them have already um, uh, 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 Banned the export of a certain products or a commodity, over a long term, this will definitely, especially from producing countries to certain commodity, this will dis de de incentivize the production uh, or increasing the production capacity in that country, which will lead to uh, the um, uh, uh, a shortage, uh, the global supply and a shortage to the global markets. And this is not the objective, I think, by, by the international trade community. Uh, so uh, as a collective response within the trade and investment and how we address that, trade and, trade and investment ministers within the G20 have um, committed to short-term solutions and long-term solutions. And that commitment uh, proves to the world and how we are trying to address these uh, 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 measures adopted by some of the members uh, in a way that just to make sure it doesn't impact the multilateral and the global supply chain. Uh, I'll just give you a touch base on a few examples. Uh, ensuring one of the, the short-term solutions 
uh, ensuring that any uh, emergency trade measures uh, uh, designed to tackle the COVID-19, um, uh, including export restrictions on vital medical supplies um, and other essential goods and services, if deemed necessary, um, uh, are targeted, proportionate, transparent, temporary, and reflect our interest in protecting the most vulnerable do not create unnecessary trade barriers, and they are in line with the WTO rules. Another solution that the, 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 the sh to share the necessary information within the G20 uh, regarding the medical supplies uh, as appropriate uh, and according uh, with applicable national uh, legislation as to facilitate the trade deals within that. Uh, encouraging the, the ministers, the G20 ministers of economy and minister of industry uh, to expand the production and to grow the production capacity in medical supplies uh, and components uh, and inconsistent with the public health guidance. And that on a short, I'll just give you again two more examples on the um, solutions on the long term uh, collective actions been agreed by and endorsed by the G20 ministers uh, to explore the COVID-19 uh, initiatives within the WTO to uh, promote an open and more resilient supply chains and expand the production capacity and trade in the areas of pharmaceutical, uh, medical, and other health-related products. Uh, and the last one, which is a point that has been addressed and uh, by some of the previous speakers in terms of the investment promotion, well, definitely one of the solutions was to work together to identify the, to identify the key areas uh, uh, where investment is needed, and uh, such as the uh, investment in medical supplies, critical medical supplies and equipments. So um, uh, these collective actions and measures uh, should improve the availability of essential products and avoid the need of trade uh, restrictions in the future. Thank you, Your uh, Excellency. And uh, now we turn to, um, to the questions from uh, our attendees at the T20 uh, uh, the first uh, question is from uh, Abdelilah Al Sheikh uh, for um, uh, uh, Princess Haifa. Uh, the question is: What is the view on uh, on the drive for privatization, the health sector or the healthcare system in developing countries, uh, and also in relatively wealthy countries in the post COVID nineteen world versus publicly supported systems? Uh, thank you, Doctor. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Abila for his question. Uh, in the uh, multi-year uh, framework uh, for financing for sustainable development, uh, we are proposing policy recommendations for mobilize, mobilizing private savings and stimulating productivity to support sustainable development and make these development countries resilient and less vulnerable to shocks. Having said that, when we encourage the private sector to invest in healthcare, or to invest in infrastructure or invest in other related activities that are by default sustainable development is in line with encouraging uh, the um, privatization of healthcare. Having said that, uh, that doesn't mean privatization uh, uh, as, we, as we see or as we've dis been discussing in the, in the G20 development working group is open as is. It is actually uh, giving the uh, right uh, policies, the right atmosphere, the right platform where financing can be channeled more, more efficiently towards achieving sustainable development. It is not an easy process or an easy um, task to achieve. That's why we're having the multi-year uh, program of action. It is highly uh, sensitive to the country's context uh, what works in Saudi Arabia might not work in other countries. Uh, I think uh, this is a very uh, complicated question, and I think uh, this can open a new set of uh, debates and uh, opinions, but yet it still falls in line with uh, what we are working on in the Financing for Sustainable Development multi-year framework. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, the next question is uh, from uh, Dr. Mohammed Antar from uh, KFUPM. Uh, and it's uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Al Amri on education. So, how would you rate the opportunities provided by switching gears to online mode of education on achieving similar out outcomes? Um, thank you very much, and for Dr. Mohammed for the question. 
Um, I, I believe that, uh, as you know, there are different modalities for, for, educate, for delivering education to students, uh, starting from face-to-face -face education, uh, electronic uh, e-learning, uh, online learning, digital content, and merging them together uh, in, in some kind of blended learning where both technology and face-to-face -face education are utilized. Of course, in the uh, normal uh, uh, settings, uh, 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 e-learning or the use of technology cannot in any way replace face-to-face uh, -face education. Actually, uh, the use of technology in education should remain uh, as a, a tool uh, to support the face-to-face -face education, given the importance of social emotional uh, development of, of students, uh, students being engaged with, with their teachers and peers in classrooms and uh, 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 playing together with, with their peers uh, uh, contribute to the uh, uh, social and emotional development of, of children. This is why we don't believe uh, that technology can replace face-to-face -face education in any way. However, it is a great tool that can be utilized uh, and uh, uh, put in, in use uh, to support face-to-face uh, -face education. Uh, blended uh, methods in which uh, both are used are uh, becoming uh, a trend in, in education. Uh, research has shown that it, it, it leads to a lot of benefits and overcome a lot of challenges. Uh, but uh, talking about emergencies and global crisis, I believe that uh, uh, countries that uh, had the infrastructure and the plans to shift into uh, the use of uh, uh, electronic uh, online and distance learning were better able to cope with the pandemic and uh, ensure the continuity of education. I cannot actually rate uh, the uh, outcomes of uh, the uh, of learning since there are two different uh, uh, delivery methods. Uh, however, I would like to highlight and underscore the uh, story of success that the Ministry of Education uh, has achieved during uh, the last few months and uh, many other G20 countries and countries uh, around the world have also their own stories of success in uh, coping with the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, next is uh, uh, Abdul Mahsan al uh, Um I think uh, there is a question related to, uh, to the IMF and the IMF reform. Uh, there have been a debate um, of the representations of um, uh, developing and emerging economies uh, within the IMF. And the question is from uh, Dr. Uh, Dash uh, from RIS uh, in New Delhi. Um, the question, I, I'll just read it. It's although, although mitigating COVID-19 funding requirements would assume priority in the agenda, do you think that the successive presidencies of G20 um, uh, will bring the issue of reforming the IMF governance, including voting rights, a multilateral development bank, and, uh, uh, and so on, as part of the finance track agenda? Probably not in the year of, um, of COVID, but maybe uh, in the uh, next few years, uh, if any. Uh, many thanks, uh, Dr. Fahad, and uh, thanks to uh, uh, our colleagues who raised this question. I think it's uh, important and very le relevant. So uh, what uh, the G20 Finance Track did uh, this year when the COVID-19 uh, began is to cooperate with international financial uh, institutions to rapidly uh, respond or provide significant financial support uh, to countries in need. As I mentioned, uh, we uh, uh, delivered uh, a comprehensive IMF support package uh, estimated to be around uh, 22 billion uh, to 60 uh, developing countries. 
uh, in uh, and also cooperate with the World Bank and multilateral development banks to uh, provide support amounting to more than 200 uh, uh, billion. Uh, as uh, seen now, uh, the, uh, these international financial institutions, uh, they have uh, sufficient resources to uh, respond to the uh, crisis. As for the governance of uh, the IMF, in 2019, uh, the G20 made good progress in discussing the 15th uh, quota review uh, which, uh, of the uh, IMF, which uh, concluded in December 2019. And in terms of the way forward, the 16th uh, quota review of the IMF will last for uh, four years. And uh, the IMF uh, has not yet started the uh, technical work of the uh, 16th quarter review. And uh, I think uh, the IMF board should start the discussion in the 16th uh, quarter review, and then uh, the G20 uh, can uh, uh, follow up on the uh, implementation. So uh, now I think uh, the focus on ensuring that those uh, institu uh, financial institutions have the sufficient capacity to uh, respond to the pandemic and they have been cooperative with the G20 to provide the comprehensive uh, emergency support to countries in need. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Um, we, have, we have two, uh, two minutes. Um, I think we have one final question for uh, Princess Haifa uh, by uh, Bertiz Novel, Novel, who is uh, a co-chair of T20 Saudi Arabia, the Task Force 3, and also a former Argentina Sharpa. Um, and the question is, uh, given the importance uh, highlighted in your presentation to quality of infrastructure investment in order to deliver on SDGs, and also for the recovery of inclusive growth in the post-COVID-19 phase. Could you please share with us what policy measures or actions are being considered to increase the FII financial capacity and also to lower risk and increase return in order to strengthen the attractiveness of private sector investment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, it, it, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. No. So uh, I, uh, the, talk, the discussion on uh, quality infrastructure uh, is darling uh, to the G20 since the beginning. Uh, and since the uh, infrastructure was uh, uh, first discussed a long time ago. And I think uh, uh, our focus uh, this year on the quality infrastructure built on what happened before or what uh, outcomes happened before, whether in, in Argentina or in Japan. Having said that, strengthening the ability of the international or the IFIs uh, in, in investing in uh, the uh, sustainable infrastructure, uh, in this dimension, what we're addressing in our priority and quality infrastructure guidelines is how can we assess infrastructure or address infrastructure as uh, a service that uh, should be paid for and thus for it is treated as a, a commodity. Um, and this um, takes us to a higher level of the risk return analysis uh, that applies to infrastructure connectivity. Um, the risk return profile of connectivity projects uh, should consider, uh, as we have discussed in the DWG, positive, both positive and negative externalities caused by connectivity infrastructure. Um, uh, the guidelines also address how policymakers should strive to improve managerial and regulatory capacity to attract the diverse market-driven financing to connectivity projects. So it's more of increasing the uh, attractiveness of investment in such infrastructure projects rather than uh, increasing the financing without increasing the right quality that can sustain uh, the management and uh, the financing of such infrastructure uh, projects. Um, uh, different things, the user fees, the uh, um, also can cover both fixed and uh, operating costs in order to ensure continued quality uh, uh, and sustainability of uh, such projects. Different dimensions that we are discussing under the uh, quality infrastructure for regional connectivity, but definitely 
It is not increasing the financing. It is increasing the quality of the management infrastructure, increasing how attractive these projects are so that it, it can attract the right financing uh, and uh, being able to sustain these projects in the future. This is the aim of the uh, guidelines. I hope my answer is clear. Sometimes uh, when we are so engaged in, uh, in the priorities, we, uh, we tend to speak in, uh, in our own language and, and assume that everyone understands what you are saying. But please, I am uh, available anytime to answer more questions on this regard. It is a beautiful outcome, and I think uh, it is uh, going to be remarkable. It's a collective G20 action under Saudi Arabian presidency. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we, we speak the same language. So uh, thank you for the, the insight. Uh, and um, I, I have uh, uh, other questions uh, on the list, but uh, unfortunately, our, our time is up. Uh, I would, at the end of this panel, I would like to uh, extend a sincere thank to uh, the chairs of the working group, our esteemed um, uh, panelists, uh, for devoting their time joining us uh, from uh, 2 p.m., uh, putting with us in terms of doing the tests and the dry runs. So we appreciate your flexibility uh, and understanding as we go from the physical to the digital world. So thank you very much for this. And um, that's the end of our panel. Uh, back to you, Saleh.